We are alienated animals. What does it mean? Animals don't wonder who they are. They don't wonder why they are here. Uh, but that's exactly what we do. That's exactly what this institute is about. So we do that all the time. And we also have a tradition in expressing that, writing reports, making art, and writing books. Who are we and why are we here? In the course of history, we had different explanations. And by designing these explanations, we also designed the world. So we used to think that there was one man in the sky, and he pretty well organized everything. We kept on wondering how things uh, were fitted together. And we looked at nature for clues. And the funny thing is, if we look out and we give an explanation, that's how we build our world. There was a time when we think that logic could explain everything, that we could calculate universe, that we could calculate the future, if we just find the right uh, logic, if we would just do the right math. There was a time that we build a world by ideology. And now we are here. Today we are creating our world by information. And we have arrived in the library of Babel. The library of Babel, which has been so well described in a story by Joach Louis Borges, an Argentine writer, already in 1941. What is the Library of Babel? The Library of Babel is a library which is as large as the universe, it's endless. And in the library are books. The books contain all the possible combinations of the letters of the alphabet, the comma and the dot. All the books are there, all knowledge is there. Your biography, my biography, the denial of my biography, the critique on the denial of my biography, everything is there. We have arrived there. All the knowledge is, as the former speaker said, is our, uh, under our fingertips. So, we have a problem. Because if you take a book from that library, probably it's all nonsense, it's random. There's only a few books with a few sentences that make sense. So how do we find the right books? How do we find truth? How do we find knowledge? in this information, in this universe of um, information. I know this problem. In my studio, I have a computer with a database with two million images. Of course, I don't really have an idea. I don't have really an idea how to navigate in this database. I don't have a, a concept of the identity of two million images. How can I? So how do I find out what is there? How do I find out which, uh, what, is, uh, what contains this database, because they are collected randomly. Um, for example, I could wonder if there could be an image of a tennis player. So then I could use another computer and design a very clever system to learn this computer what a tennis player looks like in all kinds of positions and conditions, like we heard before with the cat story. And then I could run that algorithm on the database, and then it doesn't find a tennis player. So there's no tennis player in my collection of two million images. So maybe there's a cup of soup. So then I go back to the other computer, I define, design an algorithm that finds cups of soups, and etc., etc. It's pointless, it doesn't work. So what do we do? We as a culture, took another turn. And instead of looking for content uh, and meaning, we started to look for patterns, interrelations, self-referential order. So this is what uh, my database looks like with uh, um, this technology, when I look for patterns. It's called data mining, and it's called pattern recognition. It's called knowledge engineering. Actually, knowledge engineering is what this culture, contemporary culture, is built on. It's our daily life, our beliefs, and our economical system, and even our healthcare, or part of our healthcare, 
computer-aided diagnosis. This is not a computer that looks for a specific problem. This is a computer that recognizes patterns and it comes up with patterns that might be potential problems. We use data mining in a political world. We data mine voters so we can write a proper campaign to reach out for them. We use data mining in engineering. There used to be a time in engineering that you were looking for a problem and you were going out to find it if a building was collapsing due to the cause of water. Now you stick in sensors everywhere. You collect the data, you look for patterns, and hey, when the sun comes up, the earth goes down because the, uh, the water evaporates. But you weren't looking for that, but you found it. It's a search engine, uh, a finding engine. It's not a search engine. In economy, 70% of all stock trade in the, U in the US is done by high-frequency trade machines, autonomously. Those are computers who make decisions and sell and buy thousands of stocks based on analysis. They even read the news in their own format. And here's an example from my database. I was not looking for Van Gogh, but Van Gogh found me. Van Gogh is a pattern. So what about the arts? Think about this momentum where we live. Think about all this information, the libraries, the musea, all information that we use, we store, we store it in databases. And we should be able to read those databases. Otherwise, we cannot gen generate new knowledge. So what are the qualifications of a stock trade programmer? Using applied statistical techniques to develop quantitative models. So what could be the qualifications <coughs> of an artist? Using applied statistical techniques to develop models. Because art loves mistakes. You got him? And art loves probability. Because mistakes and probability, they generate stories, they generate humor, they generate emotions. So this is what could happen with Vermeer. This is not a picture of Vermeer, this is what Vermeer is, as a, as a combined image. And now we are able to see it, to experience it, because it moves. And this is Mr. Breivik. You drop one image on the internet, and it's like a virus, including mutations. It gets a person, it gets a life. We shape it, we form him. And this is just a, a study, a classic study on portraits. So I call this a data-based art. And this data-based form of art um, could generate additional information on existing disciplines. So take, for instance, art history. If you have a museum with all kinds of landscapes, it's logical that you exhibit them by putting them on the walls. And actually, there is interactivity because you go from room to room and you can experience all these paintings. But there's other ways to experience paintings. You can put those paintings in a database. And you can explore uh, these paintings if they are in a, in a database interactively. And what you see here is a work where all these paintings, when you enter the room, they split open, and underneath the horizon, there's another horizon. And you see all these momentums of art history next of each other. It's not an alternative for classic art, art, art history, but it's an, uh, and it's also not an alternative for uh, a classic exhibition, but it's an addition. It's additional knowledge. Or well, take this work. I made this for the photo museum in Rotterdam. They had an archive of 150,000 images, and they wanted to show their archive to an audience. 
but how do you show an archive of 150,000 images to an audience? So I gave them a couple of filters. Uh, where, uh, who, uh, what, and when. Very classic journalism. And I put the filters on different posts. So the people, they, on the post, they can select different filters, they can select different times and different subjects. It's not a search engine, it's a finding engine. They are making impossible routes to the database and suddenly they come into a moment where they find all the clouds in 1953 in Southeast Asia. Or take this work. This is database art on football for FC Valencia. It's a work where you can interactively explore the identity of a football club. A football club is a formal system. Every football club shares the same system, but they are all different and they're all very specific. Take Ajax Feyenoord. They're not the same, they have a different identity, but where is it hiding and how can you feel it? Well, you can feel it if you put the identity in the database and if you use the visitors to roam it, to experience it. So in this database, I made about 18 different themes of supporters, architecture, lo local patterns, local colors, trade. And the visitors, they are exploring the identity of the club in patterns that are related to the patterns of the local uh, traditional patterns of the city itself. Another finding engine, as opposed to a search engine. Roaming a database as an experience. This software tries to link images which are, self, which are similar and puts them uh, behind each other, linear, so to create a, a sort of real-time live movie. And you can play it with an, like an instrument. And this is database art on memories. This is a work I made for the city of Enschede where there was this firework explosion in the year 2000, where the whole inner city was blown away. And I collected the images of the people who used to live there, and I bring, brought back these images into a room and invited the people to roam it. And this is the most basic methodology of organizing and reorganizing a database. You take all the images, throw them in the, w in the air, and when they come back, they have a different order and different order tells different stories. This is what art has been exploring, all art history. And on the news. In this system, I connected the computer with satellite television with about 30 international different channels. And I asked the computer to look, to look for similar images. And it does it very well. On the top ranking, the images are actually similar. The only thing that's different is the logo, but they are not so interesting. The interesting things happen when you go down in the bandwidth, when they start to differ. And that's when people start to laugh or they are shocked and things are happening. But the funny thing is, nobody ever thought of that joke. It's a probability joke. And this is something which is underlying our culture. This is a, a sort of methodology um, which is called knowledge engineering. And in a lot of sciences it's applied. And the arts can learn actually a lot from those sciences. And this is why. Thank you very much. <laughs>